Good morning. I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, yesterday, I was, of course, here to participate in the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Award Ceremony, where the theme was moving forward and serving together. And I just want to know who has the sources at the White House, because that seemed to be the theme of the inauguration this past weekend, moving forward, uh, serving together. I like to start off, though, putting us in kind of frame of mind uh, to let you know that things aren't as bad as we journalists tend to paint them. So I'm going to share with you one of my favorite poems. It is by Lucille Clifton. My daddy has paid the rent and the insurance man is gone. And the lights is back on and my uncle Brud has hit for one dollar straight. Days is good times, good times, good times. My mom has made bread and grandpa has come and everybody is drunk and dancing in the kitchen and singing in the kitchen. Of these good times, these good times, good times. Old children think about the good times by Lucille Clifton. Yes, these are good times. Now I know when you think about it, you say, well, what is she talking about good times? You know, we're at war and there's violence, black on black violence and crime and people going into a town in Connecticut and mowing down and killing 20 people, 20 lost souls. How can these be good times? Well, let me remind you that for the second time in history, we saw the inauguration of a black man to the highest office in the planet. And I have to say, at 63 years old, I never expected to see this day. I thought this would be something that my grandchildren would see. So that says to me, these is good times. Because these are the times that Americans are able to pull together and cross racial lines and ethnic groups to actually show that America has come to a place where race, race did not matter as much as we journalists thought it would matter in a presidential election. So there's hope there. He took the oath using Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Bible, the Bible that he carried around with him uh, through all his struggles and all his obstacles and all his challenges. He had this Bible and he would make notes on it. That is one of the Bibles that the President of the United States took the oath on. And in doing so, he reminded everyone and brought into everyone's consciousness how that day came to be. It came through the work of people who worked alongside Dr. King to make America a much more equitable place for everyone. So when I think about that, when I was in Washington this past weekend and I could go from uh, you know, the Capitol building over to the National Mall and see all these crowds and streams of people streaming down through the Stone of Hope into the National uh, King Memorial and looked at them and saw a picture of people from all kinds of backgrounds. I mean, there were people there with fur coats on and, you know, they were styling and profiling alongside people with their jeans on and their tatty little hooded sweatshirts. And there were white people and black people and brown people and all people walking in groups. People did not even speak the language came to that memorial to pay homage to Dr. King on an occasion where a black man was being, as we're going through his second inauguration. So it all, it's like history all came together. And I said to myself, these is good times. The other thing that I want to remind you of is that 2013 is a remarkable period for us. Uh, 20, we don't, a lot of some people don't like the, the number 13, but I'm not superstitious. 2013 marked milestones for several historic civil rights events. It is and will be the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. It will be the 150th anniversary of the placement of the Statue of Freedom atop of the Capitol Dome in Washington. The 50th anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech and the 50th anniversary of the murder of NAACP leader Megar Evers and the riots in Birmingham after the murder of four girls in Birmingham. Today I want to talk to you about some of the steps, and I'm talking to you from the perspective 
of a journalist. I know that as uh, health care workers that many of you have already answered your calling. You are involved in the, 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 the work of healing the body. Some of you are involved in the work of healing the body and the soul. So you're, you're, you're pretty tuned in to the, what you have to do in order to reach out and to help and to make things better for families and people in this community. I lived in Maywood for 30 years, so I know that you're vital in this community, that you are uh, looked to as an anchor in this community. But as a journalist, I just want to talk to you for uh, a couple of minutes about what, what more we can do. I, when I was asked, what are you going to talk about today, one of the things that I brought up was the fact that what can we do to end a culture and vi of violence in our society? I don't need to tell you that every day when I go to the newsroom, every single day, there's a horror story about something that's happened to our young people. Whether we're talking about the mass murder in Connecticut where so many lives were lost or the daily murders across the city on the west side and the south side of, of neighborhoods where children, one by one, are being martyred to me. That's what I call it. They're martyrs. In this battle that we have, and it is a fight, good versus evil, don't make no mistake about it. It's not just a, you know, the fact that so many, there are so many guns on the street. There's a mindset here. There's an evilness here. And it's a fight. This the, 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 the long time fight of good versus evil. Now we could see this fight when it came to segregation and to the inequities of Jim Crow and to the fact that at one point black people were not given the same rights as whites in this country. We could see it. We could see the evil. We could like put our hands on it. But we're having a very, very difficult time grasping that same concept when it comes to the violence in our society. It is almost as if we're wringing our hands and saying, well, what can I do? We patch up the bodies, we bury the children, we lock up the perpetrators, and we move on, and nothing really has changed. So the question that I'm asked almost daily, and one you've probably considered, is how do we end this culture of violence that we are now firmly in the grips of? And I've given it some thought, and I realized that the violence just didn't begin with the Newtown shootings, nor with the carnage that goes on daily in communities. While I understand our nation's desire to strengthen gun control laws, and I don't want to get into that whole political conversation right now, I understand it though, I understand that the easiest thing that you can target is something you can see as a gun, as long as you can visualize that gun and you can blame that gun. If we can do something about the gun, then somehow or another this problem is going to be solved. But I, I, I do not believe that. I believe that it's greater than the gun. I believe that we have to do something about the soul behind the gun. We have to do something about the people who get the guns. We have to do something about the way, the message that we send to our children that somehow it's all right to shoot people and mow people down. I, during Christmas holidays, my grandson have a wonderful, of course, the best grandson in the world, 12 years old, and I'll give him anything. Anything he asked before, I'm like, oh, I'll give it to you. Or his mom said, you're giving him too much. Or his dad says, well, he doesn't need that. I'm, grandma's going to got this. <laughs> grandma's going to do this. And he came and asked me to get him a game. And I was like, okay, you know, what do you want for Christmas? You know, and he wanted a game. So I went to the store and uh, the GameStop store and I asked for the game and it was like, first of all, I was appalled that they wanted $69.99 for a game, but okay, that's another story. But when I got the game and I got it home and I and handed it over to his mom for her to wrap up, what I noticed was this is not the kind of game that I thought my grandson would want. But it was a game that all the kids in school and all the kids online that he played with on his Xbox Live 2 thing that he has, this is a game that we're all playing. And guess what this game was about? This game was about war. This game was about shooting. This, I went to bed that night and I felt terrible. I felt terrible because I knew better. I felt terrible that I was being sucked into very cleverly sucked into this whole, it's just a game. 
But the game sends so many messages to our children. It desensitizes them to the violence. They don't really understand when a person is shot, they're dead. When you put a bullet in somebody and you tear out the, and that bullet enters their body and it tears out all the, their, through their vital organs, that's real. But we allowed it. I allowed it. Mothers all over the country are allowing it. And that's part of the problem. There's no one, no one so far has, has found a way to balance our, our First Amendment rights to make all kind of bad decisions, say anything we want to, those First Amendment rights with the whole issue of what's appropriate for our young people. And so that's a whole area that needs to be explored. And I don't care, I read all these reports about, oh, well, you know, violence doesn't really affect the world. You sit somebody in front of a, 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 a screen and let them look at pornography all day. I don't think there'd be any question that something would be wrong with them at the end of the day. That it would trigger something in them. So why do we think that we can show our children violence and violence in a very casual way and nothing that does not impact them, it does not affect them. I think that we have to look beyond the gun and look at the urgency of mental counseling. I am always, always surprised by the fervor that happens when we have a mass shooting and they go and look at the person's history and discover they had mental illness. Of course they had mental illness. What same person would don an outfit, get a bunch of uh, assault weapons, and go into a movie theater and kill somebody, and they don't have mental illness? But we have walking among us, on the street, you know, in our schools, in the workplace, everywhere, people who are not getting proper mental counseling or help for their illnesses. We have left these people on the street to fend for themselves, and then we are surprised when they go out and do what mentally ill people will do. And that's this fantasy world in which they are, you know, God, and they can take life and give life. So we have to do a better job with the mental counseling and the mental illness piece. And we have to be advocates for that. Those of us who work in the, in the uh, journalism, or who work in uh, public health, who work in schools, they have to be better advocates for uh, the mentally ill. People who are dealing with terrible, terrible mental illnesses and not getting any help for it. And I'm talking about in my own community, in my own community, I think that the, the big missed opportunity for the whole, uh, to get back for politics for a minute, the whole Jesse, former Congressman Jesse Jackson scandal is that it was a missed opportunity to really stand up and bring attention to untreated mental illness. Really to be, can you imagine how powerful that would be if someone like a congressman would stand up and really talk openly about the stigma attached to mental illness, about the inability for some people to access mental illness, and about how mental illness can, you know, how it impacts not just the person who's suffering, but the people in the family, the people in the community, everyone suffers when someone has untreated mental illness. So we have to do a much better job being advocates for that. And for a state like Illinois, who's going through, we know we, Illinois is broke, everybody knows that. And I think people in healthcare know it better than anybody else because you're picking up the pieces of it and you're having to deal with the people who do not have insurance and have no way for paying for top quality care, such as you would get at Loyola. You know what the struggle is. But for the state, to leave mental illness and people who have mental illness, leave it like what well, it's gonna take care of itself, that's appalling to me. And that is a piece that we have to get a firm grip on if we're going to do anything about changing the violence. Uh, to get back to the issue of the gun and the violence. Well, because I work in a newsroom, I see all the ways people kill each other. <clears throat> and it's not just with a gun. You know, they strangle, they stab, they do incredibly weird things like throw somebody off an L track. That's what they do. And if we don't address the personal relationships 
the what I call the anti-violence piece. If we don't, if we don't send a stronger message to combat, if, okay, we don't want to do anything about you know taking away people's violent video games or the violent uh, lyrics or any of those things. We don't want to do anything about that. Can we at least do something about combating or balancing that message with a public service announcement about violence? Because when you think about it. Everything that we're celebrating uh, for the last two days about Dr. King is tied to anti-violence. If there was ever a people that wanted to run down the street, grab a gun and start shooting, it would be the people in the South who couldn't do anything, couldn't vote, people stole their property, folks raped their daughters, they had no law on their side. But Dr. King came in that, dis in that situation and show that love conquers hate. Love conquers hate. I think we've forgotten that message. I think that we think we can fight fire with fire and evil with evil. No, you can't. Evil may rule the day, just the day, but it doesn't win the whole year. It may win that skirmish, but it's not going to win the whole battle. And so the anti-violence message from King is enduring. It cuts across history. It's not about just when we're talking about segregation or discrimination. It's about our personal relationships. It's about what happens in the household when mom is mad with daddy. It's about what happens in the community when you have some people who are throwing up one sign and some people who are throwing up another. It's about showing people how to live together in peace and harmony. And if we were to take that anti-violence message of, that King had and bring it up to date, drag it out of the 1960s and 1968, 1963, bring it up to date. We can talk about the, Washington, uh, on, on the march on Washington and all of that and all the symbolism, but today we need a march on Maywood, on Chicago in South Shore where I now live. Beautiful community, right by the lake. Right by the lake. Look, get up every morning, look out the window, see Lake Michigan, think, oh boy, these is good times. But the bottom line, when I come down out of my apartment and go down the street and try to go around the corner to the coffee shop, somebody got killed. There's tape on the street. There's tape on the street. So we have to, we have to begin to think about this nonviolence as a situation that can be fixed. Now, I really do believe that the people in the South during the Civil Rights Movement must have thought there's no way America's Jim Crow laws would fall. I believe that. I believe those people had to be scared to death. I don't know where they got their courage to live in a community and know that somebody can come and drag your husband out of the house and shoot that person for wanting to vote. But we, we have allowed the thugs, the gangbangers, the people who have ill intent to take charge in our communities. We have done that. And I'm not talking about you personally. Like I said yesterday, I'm talking about your cousin, because I know all you are doing the right thing. <laughs> but we have done that. And so we have to begin to think about, we have to begin to think about violence in a new way. We gotta give up this thought that we're just talking about guns and we're talking about the criminally, uh, people who have criminal intent with guns and we're talking about you know, folks who illegally get guns. We are talking about a mindset in America that glorifies violence.